Talking to Death is released weekly, every Wednesday, and brought to you absolutely free. But if you want ad-free listening and exclusive bonuses, subscribe to Tenderfoot Plus at tenderfootplus.com or on Apple Podcasts. Talking to Death is a production of Tenderfoot TV and iHeart Podcasts. Listener discretion is advised. Michael, how are you? I'm good. How is Payne Lindsay? He's tired. This whole podcasting thing is, you know, not as easy as it looks. You have to talk and use your mouth and breathe in and breathe out. You have to wake up at reasonable times, do Zoom calls. It's actually pretty sweet. Um, (laughs) Yeah, I was going to say. There's something about the very first episode of any true crime show, especially Up and Vanished. That first episode, it just, there's so much pressure to do it the right way creatively and to deliver the information that you need and lay it all out there for you. It's hard when my head is in another place deep in this case, but I'm having to rewind time and go back and deliver you the basic facts of this story so you can slowly get up to speed to where I'm at. And so it is always an interesting exercise to kind of go back in time a little bit and re-enter the mind frame I had basically a year ago when I knew nothing about this case. There's also an important factor to that, I think, because it's easy just to jump straight to wherever my head is at right now in the story. But I need to be able to help you as the listener get to where I'm at so you understand why I feel that way or why it's going this direction, who these people are, how do we get to this point that, that really starts with the foundation of episode one. So I just want to say welcome to any and all of the Up and Vanish listeners who migrated over from the Up and Vanish feed to check out the show. Season 4 drops in 10 days on February 16th. And starting that day, on Friday the 16th, we will be doing special recap episodes and giving you exclusive bonus content and insight and interviews with other true crime podcasters about Up and Vanish and about making true crime podcasts right here on Talking to Death. Yeah, I'm excited about being able to present this to you in a way that maybe I can't necessarily do exactly on the Up and Vanish RSS feed. I can be a little bit more candid, give you a little bit more insight on my thoughts and opinions on things, offer you what I think. You know, people always ask, what do you think? And a lot of times I, I cut that out of the Up and Vanish show because I'm trying to be as objective as possible. I'm not trying to sway you in one way or the other, but obviously we're all human and I do have personal thoughts about every single aspect of this case and I'll be able to give that to you on this show. And so again, reminder, starting on the 16th, episode one drops on the Up and Vanish feed as normal and right after that, you can come back here to Talking to Death and we'll give you a whole bunch that you cannot get in the Up and Vanish feed. And we're going to do that every single week. We have some really cool guests lined up, good friends of mine, other true crime podcasters and experts in this space. And yeah, I'm, I'm excited to pull the curtain back a little bit this season and speak a little bit more freely on some of the intricate aspects of this case and also the story building, podcast building process. I, I kind of realized that because of the way up and vanished sounds being this sort of cinematic story with music and a mix of different range of audio taking you through this sonic space it's easy to forget how real some of these elements are of the story and i think it's important to continue to highlight that and remind you just how real all of this stuff is And so I think that's what you'll probably glean from a lot of the inside stuff that we talk about right here on this show, starting on the 16th. And so at the end of this episode, I will play 
a 60 second clip from episode one that you can only hear here. It's a snippet from part of the cold open of episode one, just to give you a little taste. But moving on, I also want to welcome all the Radio Rental listeners. Thank you for migrating over. Today's episode is one of my favorites so far, if not my absolute favorite, definitively. Rain Wilson, who is an amazing human being. Anyway, today's guest is Rain Wilson. You obviously know him from The Office. He played Dwight. He's also been in a bunch of other really funny movies. He plays Terry Carnation on our show, Radio Rental. And it's funny because whenever I was making Radio Rental and I had this idea of an anthology series that was a collection of weird, bizarre, supernatural, Twilight Zone-esque stories that lived in a fictional world that became Radio Rental, which is this fictional VHS rental store. And there's this eclectic bizarre, goofy-ass shopkeeper. <laughs> um, and that's that's Terry Carnation. And when I was building the show, I had this vision for this shopkeeper character. And for whatever reason, all I could picture in my head was Rain Wilson. And I had no backup plan if we couldn't get him to do it. I didn't even think that we really could get him to do it. It was just maybe I was trying to manifest that happening. Well, through a series of emails and calls, I was able to get on a Zoom call with him, and I knew that it, it was my one shot at locking him in for this show, and I don't want to spoil too much of it because Rain and I go into how Terry Carnation started and how Radio Rental started, but we, we get into that, and he also shares his own spooky story. You could call it his own Radio Rental story. This is just a, a great human being. He's just funny as shit. I've known him for a couple of years, but we've only had so many sit down, long form conversations with each other. And we have a really deep conversation about spirituality. We talk about UFOs for a little bit. We talk about podcasting. We talk about mental health. We, we kind of go everywhere. And he's an open book, which I really appreciate. And I think you'll really enjoy this episode. And stay tuned to the very end where I'll play a 60 second clip from Up and Vanished episode one that comes out on the 16th that you can only hear right here on Talking to Death. So I, I Googled your name earlier today just yeah. to see what you did, uh, see is who it, you were. Yeah. Is it like <laughs> actresses and it's like, if you Google an actress, it's like feet come up first because <laughs> all the it? foot fetishes. Yeah, you try it. Just like Renee Zellweger, Renee Zellweger feet. Okay. And, uh, I wonder if Rain Wilson feet comes up. I'm looking for it. Um, it does. Well, there you go. It's from the office. That's disgusting. Are you serious? <laughs> is that on WikiFeet? I mean, some, yes. How do you know what WikiFeet, if WikiFeet, is that- You some, don't know WikiFeet? No. Well, have you been hiding under a rock, Payne why Lindsay? You, why do feet need their own Wikipedia page? What's Why do you think? Because there's foot fetishist perverts out there who love just sure. anything involved with feet. There's all these videos on YouTube of women that sell their feet photographs online and make pay their way through college yeah i mean i've heard about that yeah um but and WikiFeed is the i thought it was just a picture i mean why would you need to know the biography of your foot <laughs> well <laughs> right. it, it's not so much the, citing sources like that's hysterical like <laughs> <laughs> renee zelliger's feet started out uh <laughs> on, on cold mountain they were <laughs> So it, it, you know how it does this whole thing where people also search for, and it'll okay. be like your name. Yeah. And some of these kind of cracked me up with your with your name. And so I want to see if you could answer some of these questions for the internet. Oh, dear God. People okay. People wanted to know this stuff, right? Sure. So the first one is, what happened to Rain Wilson? <laughs> <laughs> what did happen to Rain Wilson? Yeah, it's- What did um, you say? What happened? What happened was, you know, I just did some acting- and raised a son and started a couple of media companies and um, and had a great time and worked on my tennis game. Did you? But uh, yeah, I play a lot of tennis. But that's, um, if 
fact, I played in two matches this weekend, lost them both. But uh, yeah, that's that's what happens when you're known for like this one role, and then I haven't played Dwight in now uh, ten years, ten or right. eleven years. You yeah, know? It's, it's a it's an offensive question. It's like assuming that you did. Yeah, what yeah. Have you, what have what happened to you? Who yeah. are you? Actually? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can just go to IMDb and just look at the credits there. It's pretty easy to do, but <laughs> yeah, it's, pretty... it's like, what happened? <laughs> right. <laughs> There's updates. Um, what does Rain Wilson speak about? I, 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 English. <laughs> like who um, asked this and what, what did they mean? I, I speak know. about uh, feet. Uh, <laughs> I speak about what happened to Rain Wilson. Um, I think that, you know, this, cause this book came out, uh, Soul Boom, uh, six months ago. And so I've just been doing a lot of speaking tours mm. and going to college campuses and stuff like that. So okay. my, my imagination goes to like, why is, you know, and, and one of the questions I bring up in the book early on is like, why the hell is the guy named, who played Dwight on The Office talking about spirituality? Right. So I wonder if it's just people like, this is just weird. How do I process this? Yeah. Do you feel like people in general, and, it may, and we're probably even a victim of that too, just when they know someone for, for a thing yeah. that it's like, oh, that's the guy that does that thing. Uh, he can't do this thing and this thing at the same time. Yeah. Like our yeah. brains just won't let us or. Absolutely. Uh, what's up with that? Yeah, I think people just get lazy in that way. I think that, and it, and by the way, it works that way in show business too. It's kind of like, oh, it's the guy who plays Dwight. So he plays big, weird uh, comic characters on sitcoms yeah. and he's not really an actor, but I played, you know, I played dozens of roles in the theater before I ever got to do TV and film. And then I played dozens of roles in TV and film before I played Dwight. Right. Then while I was playing Dwight, I played another good dozen or a couple dozen roles yeah. in, you know, in movies like Super and, you know, lots of other, some some bigger movies, some smaller movies. And then after Dwight, you know, 10 or 11 years ago, I played dozens of roles. So this is what an actor does, right? You You play roles and you transform. I'm not like, I'm not, the Dwight guy, you but act. <laughs> I act. One of those roles took off like a rocket right. and was a home run. Mm -hmm. Great TV show. Love it. Thrilled. So grateful. But guys, I'm an actor. You're a podcaster and journalist and host, right? Just yeah. a podcaster though. Forever. Just a podcaster. Yeah. No, just a true crime podcaster. Just a true crime. Yeah, if there's I, not a dead body involved, no one yeah. is a fuck. I'll or a UFO. The, I'll do a new podcast, like High Strange, for example, yeah. and I'll put it out and someone will, someone will make a comment on my Instagram and say, is this the new Up and Vanished? And I'm like, <laughs> what? <laughs> how, how could it be? What? Yeah. what? I would be the worst <laughs> marketing executive known to man no. to, call, to call the new uh, season of Up and Vanished High Strange. And only be about UFOs and yeah. nothing else. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I got two more for you real yeah, quick. Yeah, hit me. Um, what's Rain Wilson's real name? It's very true. But I will say it is Rain Dietrich Wilson, but it's hysterical. Someone on my Wikipedia slipped in the name Percival. So on my Wikipedia, it says Rain Percival Wilson or Rain Percival Dietrich Wilson, I forget which one it is. And now that's showing up all over. I went and did an interview with someone. They're still like, so Rain Percival, how'd you get the name Percival? <laughs> so bravo to you, chef's kiss, kudos. Wow, um, and it just stuck. It just stuck. All those donations they want on Wikipedia and they just can't get it right still. They can't get it right, but Damn. I, li I like it. No, that's kind of funny. It works for me. They did well, they trolled you. It works for me. Um, how did this is so this is a bad one. How does Rain Wilson pronounce his name? <laughs> Ryan Wilson. Yeah. That's, that's what I thought. Yeah. I've been saying it wrong the whole time. That, that was another one that was, you know, always with substitute teachers. They'd be like, Ryan. I was like, well, it's Rain, R A I N, right? Yeah. Then if you add an N, how does that, how would that possibly change the vowel sound there? Like, it's more of Rain now. It's, it's Rain. Just, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. When you were on the journey of becoming an actor, growing up and going through Hollywood before The Office and before any of your big movies, did you aspire to be where you are today? Uh, like, what did what was the perfect vision you had for yourself if you had done it correctly or fulfilled your dream? Well, I love that question, uh, Payne. I, seriously, I do because um, 
it's uh, my career and my life as an actor surpassed my wildest dreams. I never in a thousand years would have thought that I would be a guy. And when you go into Target, my face is on mugs <laughs> and on bath mats <laughs> and, yeah. you know, and dish towels. Are you numb to it? I mean, every once in a while, people will send me some new things like, oh, look, my face is on jelly beans now. Like, I hope I get a check for that. That's so weird. <laughs> yeah. But I, um, yeah, you know, I started, I really fell in love with acting and I fell in love with the theater. And I was a nerdy theater kid. I, I was a nerdy kid in, in high school and I was, I played the bassoon and I was in the marching band and I was uh, in Model United Nations and I was on the chess team. And I was just dorky Dungeons and Dragons kid. And then I moved to this new school that had a good drama department. And I started doing acting, and which is also dorky in a slightly different way. Yeah. And I found I was pretty good at it and I could make people laugh. And I was always kind of a goofball and I would just channel that into acting. And I fell in love with acting and theater and then did a bunch of plays in college. And then I went to acting school in New York Again, just did nothing but theater. I wasn't even thinking about film or TV. And it's funny, the um, I, I did, one of my first jobs was this bus and truck Shakespeare tour going around the United States. And we performed Romeo and Juliet and A Midsummer Night's Dream. And we would pull into like a community college or downtown somewhere and we would set up our rinky dink little stage and we would perform. And sometimes wow. it was high school, sometimes the high school auditoriums at like 10 a.m. <laughs> And it was, which yeah. is brutal. And um, one of the guys on the tour was Jeffrey Wright. Um, I forget, is he nominated for an Oscar this year? Uh, he's in this new film, American Fiction. He's been in tons of stuff. Uh, you'd recognize him in a heartbeat. He's, he's an incredible actor. And I was playing Demetrius in Midsummer Night's Dream and he was Puck. And we finished the tour. We were on the road for like seven months. We get back to pick up our mail at the office. And I, I remember looking at my bank statement and it's like, I had saved the whole tour. I had saved $1,200. Damn. And I was coming back to New York City with $1,200 in the bank and I had just worked for six or seven months. I was like, fuck. And then Jeffrey Wright is opening his mail and he's like, whoa. And I look over and he's like, what? And he goes, I got a residual check. Speaking of residual oh, checks. Oh, wow, okay. He did three days on a Harrison Ford movie he had a check for thirty five hundred dollars in Damn. his hand in residuals. Double what you did for seven months. That Harrison Ford money. And I just was, I just shook my head and I was like, okay, I need, uh, I'm in the wrong business. <laughs> I need to really seriously think about. And that's when I started going like, okay, shit, I gotta, I really gotta pursue this more and not just, you know, you can barely keep the lights on as a theater actor, but I got to supplement it with some TV and film. But I just thought of myself like, oh, I'm going to do some cool plays at some theaters, you know, and I'm going to go, you know, the, what's the Alliance in Atlanta? Yeah. And I'm going to go to the Mark Taper Forum and maybe some off Broadway. And and then occasionally I'll do like a guest spot on Law and Order or yeah. some, or Frasier or something like that. And, and, uh, do a quirky character and that'll kind of help me keep the lights on and, mm -hmm. and keep me in Trader Joe's money. So I came to LA um, in around the year 2000 and uh, things just started taking off here in a, in a kind of a crazy way. Yeah. And um, after a few years of, you know, some guest spots and movie roles and, and whatnot, um, uh, I, I, I got on Six Feet Under, which is the show I did before The Office, which was a big show on HBO at the time, and, uh, and then on to The Office after that. So, uh, and then like lead roles in feature films and, mm -hmm. and you know, development deals and uh, all kinds of opportunities. I was this door, I, again, I was this pimply Dungeons and Dragons kid who turned into a theater geek. So it was beyond my wildest dreams. 100%. Did you ever reach a point in your career where you felt like you had done it all? Uh, were you, at the height of the busyness of the office, what kept driving you to keep going back to work and not just say, man, I did it, I'm tired? Well, the it's funny you say that because it's like kind of right now, I'm like in my late 50s and I'm like, wow, I've really, 
I won't say I've done it all because I haven't, yeah. obviously. But um, you know, I've never been nominated for an Oscar, let's say. Uh, uh, although, you know, that's a long shot, but there is part of me is kind of like, you know, I did 10 years in the theater and I did 20 years in film and TV. I've played a bunch of memorable roles. I got a bunch of Emmy nominations, did not win. Thank you, Jeremy Piven. Um, and, uh, and now that I'm doing kind of more writing and podcasting and, some other, you know, stuff in the nonprofit world. I, part of me is like, yeah, do I want to stick with this acting thing? I don't think I'd ever like quit acting, right. but I think I would like, as they say, I'd be entertaining offers, you know, just <laughs> sure, kind of yeah. like, I'm not going to pursue shit. If someone wants to offer me X amount of money to go play a cool role somewhere, I would, I would seriously consider it. But there's part of, part of me is kind of at that place right now. Like I, I don't, I don't have the same hustle that I had 10 or 15 years ago. But you're not starving artists anymore, are you? I mean, I'm was not, that part of it? it had that, to be a little bit. That is part of it. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I didn't have a trust fund and, you know, I needed to make the, the money myself. And if I wasn't going to get the next guest spot or the next pilot role, then I wasn't going to be able to pay rent. So... That is definitely a driver. But then it starts to get really unhealthy. And, you know, even when I was on the office and making a lot of money, like there was long periods of time while on the office where I was really unhappy because Why? it just, it wasn't enough. You know, it just. In what way? Well, it's kind of, maybe maybe you can relate to this and I'd love to hear sure. your your take on it too. I think it's that it's that ancient human kind of crazy hunger, like, for more like, oh, this feels good, I want some more. Like, um, I was talking to BJ Novak about it and mm -hmm. he was like, we both had the, we did this event at the 92nd Street Y and <clears throat> we said the one thing we regret most about the office is that we didn't enjoy it more. So really? here we are, here I am on one of the most successful TV shows ever, nominated for Emmys, making nice money, great people, people love the show. It's really high quality. And I was like, yeah, but I want, I want more. More you know? what? I want more, more fame. I want more money. I want more attention. I want more status. Mm -hmm. um, I wanna be, I wanna like, you know, Will Ferrell, Jack Black, those guys have like big ass movie star careers. Like, can I, I want that. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that didn't work out for me. And frankly, I'm kind of, I'm pretty funny, but, I'm not at a Will Ferrell, Jack Black level funny. You know what I mean? And and that's okay. I'm I'm fine with that. But it's that it's that old that ancient human conundrum of like, it's never enough. It's never enough. I mean, John John D. Rockefeller, the richest man in the world at the time, had a reporter ask him, "How much money is enough?" Right. And he famously replied, "Just a little bit more." So that's kind of how I was on The Office. It was like just a little bit more as opposed to, this is fucking great, man. Just fucking enjoy it. So how, what would you have done d literally differently with this, the, with this hindsight you have now? It's most literally just be grateful for what I have and just relish it. Not and, punish yourself and yeah, try to get to another level. Or yeah, you know, of course, would I have tried to develop projects and audition and try and do some film roles, of course, but just be much less attached to the outcome. You know, mm. the Buddha teaches about suffering and the root cause of suffering is attachment and grasping, right? It's, it's, it's not being present in yourself and just being at peace with what you have, kind of one breath at a time, being in the moment. It's, it's this constant human clutching and grasping for something outside of ourselves to to fill the void, to fill, to fill the pain and soothe the pain. And I would have just done less clutching and grasping. That's all. How, how are you dealing with that? You, one of the most successful podcasters in the country, I put you in the top 10, you know, you have the Midas touch. So many of your shows Thank you. go into the top 10. You have, you just have a, a really, for whatever reason, you're this kind of like we wacky. We figure it out. You Weird motherfucker. You look like a, <laughs> you know, an ecstasy swilling club kid. Um, Thank you. Uh, but you, 
for some reason- I have... would sell your kid drugs. <laughs> you look like you'd sell someone Molly at, at <laughs> right. uh, Coachella. But, the good uh, kind, though. The good kind of Molly? Yeah, yeah. Not the, you know, overdose Not kind. the bathtub kind. <laughs> yeah. And, but, you know, you've you've been incredibly successful, mostly in true crime, but, you know, yeah. Radio Rental and High Strange and many other uh, great shows. And how does that feel for you? Does it feel like- um, does it feel like, well, I want the TV deal or I want Tenderfoot to be bought by Amazon or I, right. why I want to cash in in this way and how come, I how come no one's approached me to have a, you know, my own show or, you know, do you know what I mean? Like, I mean, totally. I mean, like when Up and Vanish became successful, that was the first time I'd ever gotten a taste of, of, of anything like that. And it was to me a culmination of all the work I'd done throughout my whole career, going back to being in, doing my own music and doing music videos and eventually telling my own true crime story. And once it started clicking, you know, a part of me for the sustainability of my own future and to have a career and to no longer be a starving artist was going to grab onto the horns and never let go. And the first thought I had after Up and Vanish was, I don't want to be known just as the up and vanish guy. This was a conscious thought that I had. So I went and made Atlanta Monster. And then I went on tour. Then I made Up and Vanish Season 2. Then I made Radio Rental. And, and then I, I looked up one day and was like, you know, what, what the hell happened over these four years? Like, how did I... I'm in a house that I bought now. How did I get here, right? And it wasn't really until last year when I was working on High Strange that I had this sort of eye-opening moment. And I realized uh, editing an episode of High Strange, that this, this moment that I was in is like the pinnacle of my happiness. I love building this world. I like having set this up yeah. and I'm in full control over this, this thing and it's yeah. fun and it's all for the right reasons and it's all these different boxes that are checked. And so it's not about doing this to get here. It's about being able to keep doing this at all or having... Well, that's good. That's very healthy. In, in a way where it's yeah. like just doing it is kind of the point for me, I think. But look, man, this is how we're both so lucky. We're, we both get to tell stories. Yeah. We're storytellers like mm -hmm. in different ways. An yeah. actor's a storyteller, a podcast producer, host, director, editor is as well. And, you know, the thing I love about your stories is like I'm a huge Up and Vanish fan, but uh, and Atlanta Monster, like you have a social commentary running through it. It's not mm -hmm. just salacious true crime. Like you're like, you're peeling the onion and kind of like yeah. a little bit on how the world works. And even in High Strange and like the conspiracies mm -hmm. around, around, you know, UAEs and, and the government and cover-ups and uh, it's, it's, dare I say, it's important. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, sure. like it mean that that approach, or yeah, and also the way that you did, like, season, uh, up and vanish was it season three? The, um, you know, on the on the Indian reservation, yeah. like the 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 injustice and the economic injustice going on, and, yeah. the, and the reality of that life, like you opened that up to millions of people. Yeah, and it's a scary topic to try to try try to navigate. Yeah. It's like. I mean, it's, it sounds messed up, but it would be easier, not saying I, I, I should or I want to, to make it about a white woman. Mm -hmm. Because it, there's less tape to navigate to do it respectfully and appropriately. And that just comes with the territory. And those are challenges that I want to take on. Yeah. Because I think that's part of the reason why people who are really talented don't do that is because they don't want to challenge themselves hmm. and step hmm. out of the box and learn something yeah. about somebody else and how their life is different than theirs versus doing what they know how to do already. Yeah. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Well said. Well, I'm glad you made that adjustment and that you get to just relish doing what you get to do, you know? And it's true when you do a season of one of your, one of your shows, like you're, you get to be like, you get to be God in a way, right? right. Like you, you, you're controlling the story and the tone and the and the I music. Know what you don't and, know, <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah, you're slowly dispersing. You're your, like you're dripping you out crumbs. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Come on, okay. I'll give you a bigger one because you're getting impatient. <laughs> Speaking of that, I want the I want links to the new the whole new season. Oh yeah, I was also super high when I texted you that little clip, and then I was like, 
you know, I just made it. And yeah. I was like, is this too much? Is this amazing? Is this the worst shit I've ever done? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I don't know. <laughs> but I'm like, Psh, here it goes. It's awesome. You uh, were. That's my, that's my beta test. It's like, as I'm making the podcast, I'll export little nuggets and shoot them out to some of my friends and, you know, just <laughs> see what they say. Sometimes they say nothing. Sometimes they're like, there's a lot of people out there looking for you. Yeah. West Beach, all the way to the rivers and all the way up through that. Country. I don't want to give too much away. It was really cool. This will cool. be out by then. So that's, oh, okay. that's the cliffhanger for episode one. Okay. Which comes out on the 16th of February. Sweet. So this will be out. Actually, it'll probably be almost bingeable by then. Um, crazy story though. I mean, this woman went missing from Nome, Alaska. I'm not sure if you know where that is on a yeah, map. Yeah, it's like an, it's in total... basically Russia. It, yeah, it's yeah. so far away. Yeah. Um, small town of 3,000 people, and there's been about 24 unsolved disappearances in the past couple decades, and just very odd numbers for the size of yeah. the population. Yeah. And there's just some nefarious shit going on over there. And uh, it's been really scary and... Uh, eye-opening i think it's uh probably one, one of the most in-depth seasons of a show i've ever done um damn excited to did you ever feel in danger in absolutely that? so yeah i'll just go ahead and say this now because it'll be out or i'll just cut it but there was a, a time there's a guy the main suspect and this 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 woman was murdered she's not just missing she didn't go off on her own i believe she was murdered and there's a main suspect and her clothes or belongings were last seen in his tent. He's the last man to have seen her. He fled Nome after this. He's got a big rap sheet. He's not a good guy. And so I have a fake Facebook account that I started years ago. So it looks kind of legit now because it's been there for years. Yeah. And I won't say the name because people are going to go fuck it up. But um, I just started messaging him. I was like, hey, um, do you miss Alaska? And I just started talking to him. And for whatever reason, he just took the bait. And eventually, I, I was trying to figure it's out- It's not under I'm your going. name, this fake no, one? No, I catfished him. And oh, shit. I, uh, I eventually found out where he was, so I had the option of going and pouncing on him and just saying, hey, boo, gotcha, my name's Payne Lindsay, let's talk about this case, which I knew he would just say, fuck off. Right. Um, and I was like, what's the point? Like, why did I come here? Is, was it to get that moment for the podcast, or do I- step out of my comfort zone or whatever you think the journalistic ethics should be and try to figure out if he did it or not, because that's what the family wants me to do. And so I met him as this fake guy, terrified that he was going to, to figure out who I was. He didn't. And we talked for two hours on the record and in my opinion, said some very incriminating statements. And to this day, I'm not Fully sure if he knows if I'm Payne Lindsay or not. He's, a, he's about to know. Um, or if he does know and he's trying to play the game, then I think he lost with trying to play with fire. And so it's a very strange wow. thing, but it's like, it's what the detectives do in the movies. Right? Yeah, yeah. It's like what they do on True Detective, but no one is really doing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you, but you get to do that. <laughs> but I was really doing that, yeah. Damn. So yeah, that was scary. That, I'll, I'll be honest. That sounds scary. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Mad props, man. That's crazy. You should tell BJ Novak that I'm, I wish that I had a cameo in that movie he did about the true crime thing. Yeah. Like it was so good and he nailed it. They, they did send me some little box or something, but I, was like, I don't want the box. I want like, I think some people like, you know, not that I'm anybody would probably think that I wouldn't want to make fun of myself, but that's all like me and my team ever talk about is how- right much of a trope this shit is sometimes <laughs> yeah <laughs> right? yeah yeah that's that's hysterical yeah i love i love the way he went right into that <laughs> it's uh, perfect yeah uh yeah totally totally listen um i talk about this in soul boom uh a lot like it's it's the ancient spiritual journey that we're on and every spiritual journey has to do with the ego right mm. you you go as far back as you want. You can go to Zoroastrianism and Hinduism and Buddhism. It's all about the ego. The ego wants pleasure. The ego wants status. The ego wants control. The ego wants power. Um, the ego wants kind of sex and comfort. These are, this is our natural egoic, you know, uh, desire. And that's 
it's, a, it's our caveman desire. It's There's human not, instincts, what you're saying. It's human instinct. There's nothing wrong with it sure. per se and on the right level. But then when you g are given billions of dollars and a great deal of power, that ego can, um, uh, and I've, I've had little tastes of that. You know, I had little mm -hmm. tastes of that, a kind of narcissism and entitlement. Are um, you, you mean like- you, Yeah, yeah, Like you yeah. checked yourself and said, hey, or- what? I've had to check myself a ton. My wife, my wife has had to check me Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so like- In like what way would she do that? Like, hey. Well, just being kind of a self-entitled prick at the height of the office fame and doing a lot of other movies. Like you got my coffee wrong kind of thing or what? God, there's so many, um, yeah, they're just being, you know, being a short, impatient, sure. judgmental, like- I didn't prioritize family time when my son mm -hmm. was born and really young, like, mm -hmm. and I would just be like, I'm too busy and, right. you know, you, you, we need to schedule this and it's, you know, my- Make it ends meet, right? Yeah, and, yeah, and, I'm, and I'm working hard for the family. For but, this family, right? But it, was, yeah. it, was, it wasn't actions as much as it was attitude, but I was, I could be a not pleasant. There, were, there was a while there I could not be a very pleasant guy. Mm. And um, so, but I think that, you know, I look at it from from spiritual terms that we, everyone is struggling in some way, shape, or form with with ego. You don't have to be Elon Musk. You don't have to be one of the characters on Succession. Right. You know, you can. I've met plenty of people that have a very small domain. Right. Like they're <laughs> yeah. they're a parking attendant in a circle of like seven other parking attendants. But there's a hierarchy and a struggle and oh, a yeah. battle for for power and control and status and money. No one's immune to it, yeah. No one's immune and we're all on that journey to try and to quiet that that voice and to seek a, a, a greater selflessness, a greater altruism um, and sacrificing, sacrificing time, energy, comfort uh, for the betterment of others. That's, that's just, Plain and simple, that's the spiritual path. It doesn't matter if you're Christian, Muslim, Buddhist, it doesn't really matter. I'm a Baha'i, it, it, but that's that's the path we're on. Um, and your life will get healthier, deeper, richer, and wiser the more you kind of embrace and love your ego, but recognize it and say, I wanna, I wanna focus kind of on my on my higher self. Is it about self? Clarity and uh, healing. Do you believe in a higher power, or, or what are your thoughts? What do I believe? I, yeah. yeah, I believe. I believe in a higher power. I I believe. What that. does that look like, or what does that mean? Well, it's. I I have a chapter in the Soul Boom book mm -hmm. called the Notorious God. <laughs> nice. So that's that's what I believe in the Notorious <laughs> God. But I think God. People have a hard time with with God because. Um, God is equated in Western culture with the patriarchy, and it's like big daddy God. I call him Sky Daddy. Uh, Sky Daddy with a beard who knows everything we're doing. It's basically Santa Claus. Hey, Pain, <laughs> yeah. Pain, you've been naughty and nice. If you're naughty, you're gonna go to hell, or you're naughty, I'm gonna punish you. Uh -huh. And if you're nice, I'm gonna reward you. Yep. And um, this is baked into our culture, right? It's in mm -hmm. the Sistine Chapel. It's in our thoughts. It's in the Our Father who art in heaven. Like it's, it's on the coins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and so for me, uh, I had a real revelation when I was reading about. I was really struggling with God, and and a lot of people are. And I was reading about the God of the Lakota Sioux people, mm -hmm. and the God concept in that region of those indigenous people is called Wakantanka, which means the great mystery. So immediately when you think about God as the great mystery and you don't think of a man and you don't think of a guy, you don't think of a persona with superpowers on a cloud, you start thinking about the great mystery is contained within and throughout nature and throughout time and throughout the elements and throughout north south east and west throughout the the multiverse that it's a it's a mysterious kind of creative force like like not an entity but like a, the sum of everything or that you're getting in a way? you're getting closer there i mean i that kind of, yeah yeah i believe that you know the the higher power that i look at i do think has some some will so it's not just like okay. a vague like electronic force or something like that but there is uh, but more some, than science? 
I think I think God is more than science. I think there is some volition. I think there is some will coming from that, from that cosmic creative force. Um, and it's funny because I sat at this exact same table talking to Neil Brennan about the cosmic creative <laughs> That's force. Pretty weird. And uh, <laughs> uh, in this podcast, this very podcast studio, and um, yeah, but that but that really opened my eyes to a new way of thinking about God and realizing like a lot of people who say I don't believe in God, I say well define your God, because I probably yeah. don't believe in the God that you don't believe in. That's my thing with, with religion that's always kind of bothered me or, or I've, I've struggled with is, you know, is it that your God is real and this one is not? Yeah. You know, because I mean, with a lot of religions, and you know, in America, especially if you believe this, then you're basically saying that they're wrong. Yeah. And so, yeah. you know, do you feel like the God that you believe in is the correct one? Or do you believe that there is a God for everybody in some way, or they can coexist, or is there anything definitive, or is that not even what it's about, or I don't know. Yeah, no, no, it's, you, you, what you say is exactly right. I once heard a radio show, and there was a, a Muslim and a Jew and a Christian talking about faith and belief and whatnot. Walking to a bar and- <laughs> Set up for a joke. And- they were talking about God and this and that, and you know the Muslim was referring to him as Allah, and, the, and then the Christian pastor was like, I don't believe in Allah, and what you're worshiping is not God, and I think it's a false prophet, and uh, because I understand God as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, mm -hmm. and I understand the triune God, and that's, that's the true God, and anyone who's worshiping anything else is a false, it's a false God, it's an idol. And of course that's poppycock, I mean, give me a break. I think anyone who is seeking some kind of higher truth or transcendence or beauty or higher connection beyond just kind of like our kind of material bodies that are, you know, eating and, and pooping and <laughs> fucking and all the stuff that right. bodies do, anyone who's, that's a connection to to something higher. However you conceive of that, whether it's Wakantanka or Allah or, mm -hmm. or God or Jehovah or, the princess Gaia or, you know, a Wiccan God or whatever, it's whatever force is out there. So, but that's throughout human history. It's been like our God versus your God. And, and that, and that goes back to the caveman days of like, we worship this rock God named Thargon. Mm -hmm. And then you worship this log God named Govlax. <laughs> and our God, if we conquer you, then our God is more powerful and we're going to make you worship our God. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. That's, that's tens of thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years yeah. of people doing that. So we that we have that kind of baked in too, is our, our God versus your God. Versus like tribal sense almost, right? Yeah. 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 I mean, where that that goes hand in hand. Tribalism goes hand in hand with ego. Yeah. So we're talking about Elon Musk, we're talking about Twitter, you know, Twitter is a bunch of egoistic tribes. It is it is the perfect showcase yeah. for egoism and tribalism. And it's not helping the conversation. It's <laughs> no. not helping the evolution away from self and ego. I do I do always feel a little bit uh like a breath of fresh air when I read some of your tweets because it's always like, thank God finally someone is not taking <laughs> taking any of this shit seriously. It's crazy out here. <laughs> you know what I mean? I try and lighten things up. Sometimes. I always appreciate it. Though. Although I used to be on Twitter every day, and now like, yeah. I send one or two out a Poison. week, and it's 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 I don't have it on my phone. You mean X, right? Yeah, X. Sorry, yeah. Yeah. it's never going to stick. Um, I re I read a story uh, like I'd never heard of before that y your dad prayed away the ghosts in some Nicaraguan house, and it was maybe haunted. What the? What are you talking about? What happened? For for real. For real? Okay, get, tell me the story. For real, for real, real, real. So- What's for real? My family were members of the Baha'i faith. Okay. And we moved to Nicaragua in 1969. I was three years old to go teach the Baha'i faith, kind of, kind of missionary work, but we weren't like, kind of like converting the natives. It was more, it was a little more positive than that. So there was a house for rent on top of the hill, that was this old Victorian house in this town called Blue Fields, Nicaragua. And it was really cheap. And everyone was like, oh, you don't wanna rent that house, it's haunted. And we're like, okay, yeah, whatever. We're Americans, fuck you. So we rented the house. This is what I've learned in the years. I was only three, so I was just running around sucking my thumb. But um, apparently every night 
we would go to bed and my dad would hear these noises coming from downstairs, like, and then he kind of noticed, like he would get up in the morning and go down and like, why are the chairs in slightly different positions? Why has everything been moved a little bit? And sure enough, the next night, it was like going to bed in the middle of the night, kind of, And he's like, what the hell? So he went and got a piece of chalk and he went downstairs one night and drew circles around all of the furniture and then went up to sleep, heard the same noises, went down in the morning, every single piece of furniture in the house had moved by three or four inches. So it was real. It was totally real. So he was like, holy shit. So. This is what he did. He There's a Baha'i prayer book that's filled with all kinds of prayers. And some of the prayers, there's a section like for the departed prayers mm-hmm. that you say when someone passes, you know, for the journey of their soul. And my dad and my stepmom sat down and said every single prayer for the departed <laughs> bet, yeah. from top to bottom and just, you know, prayed to just kind of like let the, whatever souls are trapped in this house or whatever force or whatever it is. I mean, I don't know what to think. What'd your dad think it was? He just thought it, he thought it, he knew it had to have been some kind of ghost. It wasn't like a, there was no one sneaking in the house. The doors were locked. It wasn't like a- What was a ghost to your dad? Like, like a- I mean, this seems like like classic poltergeist, but I don't, I don't really know what my dad thought. He passed away a few years ago. I would have asked him otherwise, but I don't know what he thought. I mean, he just thought it was some kind of poltergeist force. Yeah. But after that, after they did that prayers, it never happened again. Really? Every single night after that, there were never noises and no furniture moved. So what do you, so, what do you take from that then? I take from that, that if you need to get rid of a ghost, get pick yourself up a Baha'i prayer book, say all the departed prayers, boom, problem solved, boom. Is this your radio rental story? Or it could be, yeah. I hey. could be a, that would be pretty meta if Rain Wilson called in with a radio rental right. story. But we don't even say you're Rain Wilson though, just like everyone else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just, just, <laughs> just a voice, <laughs> yeah. a random voice. Let's talk for a second about the origin of Terry Carnation, um, how that all yeah. started. So I had this idea along with my friend Aaron Lee, who's a brilliant comedy writer, of this, you know, a a character that I could play in some kind of recurring way. We really loved, we were huge fans of Steve Coogan and his character, Alan Partridge. And if you know anything about Steve Coogan, he's done straight parts in movies and he's been in lots of different kinds of films and TV. But at some point, maybe the early nineties or something, he started playing this character named Alan Partridge. He started as a newscaster and sportscaster. Then he had like a sitcom then he had like a podcast and then he's written audio books and he's had a bunch of different TV shows and he even has a a, a great uh, movie called Alpha Papa, um, this Alan Partridge comedy. And he's this doofus kind of like middle-class, big-toothed, self-important newscaster. Right. And I just loved how there was an actor who had created this long-term character. So we were talking about you know, what kind of character could I play and how would this work? And we had this idea for Terry Carnation and we had an idea that he would be hosting a paranormal radio call-in show, kind of like coast to coast AM. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, and we were inventing things about him and this and that. And literally at that same time, you called and we have the same podcast agent and you're like, I want to start doing this radio rental and I want to have kind of like, a host, like a crypt keeper kind of host, or would Rain do it, or would he play a character, or it would be really fun, because I had tweeted how much I loved Atlanta Monster, which mm-hmm. I really loved that that whole series that you did. And um, so you knew I was a fan, and, uh, and I was like, yeah, I'll do it if I can play Terry Carnation uh, as the character. Yeah. Kind of the, the host crypt keeper guy at the video rental store, so. That's, then we just- It was kind of serendipitous to yeah. me, because I mean, I, I remember hopping on the Zoom, because I didn't, I had no backup plans if you were like, hey man, too busy, can't do this. Yeah. I only could see you in my head doing it. I don't know 
where that even came from. Yeah, that's funny. And then I, I was like in New York City and I had a Zoom schedule with you. I was like, God, I was so tired. I was a little hungover too. I was like, I, I can't blow this. You know, I was like, yeah. let me just sell them on this somehow and hop on the Zoom and described it to you. And I was like, what do you mean you have a similar character that you have? I'm like, is he being for real? Does he think I'm being for real? Does yeah. I was like, well, shit. Uh, that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> do you want to do it then? Yeah. Uh, but that's no, been super fun. Um, it's been a great collaboration, and we were able to make a whole Terry Carnation show separate from Radio Rental. Yeah. Uh, and that was really fun, too, to kind of take him into some other... That was more of a straight-up just comedy show. Um, and uh, yeah, But it's been super fun. I mean, obviously... People love the show. They're such huge fans of it. There's such a loyal fan base. But yeah, that's and it and it worked out great. And I love working with Meredith and we have a lot of fun doing it. People people really enjoy the show and and they love following Terry and Malachi, his cat, and their yeah. little misadventures uh in between those spooky, spooky stories. I, I really need your help with something. I mean okay. you, you know how hard it is to sell a show in Hollywood. It doesn't matter who you are, what you're doing. Yes. And you know, but my, my vision for Radio Rental in the first place was always uh, like bigger than the podcast itself. It, it would be a really fun thing to reimagine visually in either an anthology series or a movie series or yeah. whatever it is, some scripted version of it, right? Um, but it's a big swing because it's, it, they have to bet on making this world and, yeah. you know, we've gone and we've, we've kicked it around a few different times and we've almost sold it a few different times. And, you know, really just selfishly, I, I just want to see it get made. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I'm like, you know, I, I care less about my stake. And I'm like, if we banded together in something that made sense, that didn't hurt whatever you were trying to do, you Pain, were, you're you putting were an me, EP. You're putting me on the spot right here. You, you want... sign this piece of paper right here. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it'd be fun though, I think. Um, yeah, man, that would be super fun. It'd be cool. Wish uh, we should talk about work, it. You know? But it would be, it, would, it, it is a tricky one to figure out. It is. Because the audio stories are so interesting. I'm not sure it'd be. What would you want it to be though? Well, it's... I don't know. I mean, I haven't given any thought to it, but if you had. Knee jerk reaction though. The the problem with it is is I don't necessarily want to see uh, I don't necessarily want to see the people telling the stories. No. And do you want to? Because the the obvious way, like low budget way to do it on like Discovery would be yeah. Um, and I don't, I don't people really telling do spooky stories and then having reenactments. Of yeah, it. but that's just kind of like. Have you ever thought about it animated? Um, we have, um, but I feel like it it deserves more than that still. Yeah. Uh, but it would still be cool. Um, if, Cause if then you could correctly. hear people's voiceovers mm -hmm. yeah. and then animate them and get different animators for each story. So you didn't have a uniform style of animation. One was more like anime and one more was hand drawn. One was like AI, you right. know, and then depending on suiting the story, then each one is like a little black mirror, but like, yeah, or, or, or is it more anthology, black mirror, modern pop culture, but they're all based on true stories. Uh, or, or internet oh. lore or a creepy pasta. Do, you, do you guys own the rights to all the stories? Um, we, um, like, if someone comes on and tells like a ghost story or a all the big ones, we definitely do because we've you know even pitched those out separately. Yeah. Um, but they'd all be down to you know for us to option that if they yeah. can see it come to life. Yeah, um, yeah. So I mean, and also the way it works, they probably always want new stories anyways. But yeah, but I know how hard it is for you guys to find those stories. So. So it's so much work. You're going on Reddit and you're just yeah. If I was know, combing the internet and and yeah. YouTube and you got researchers and yeah yeah. It's a it's a slog. I mean, it's it'd be easier to make them up. So, <laughs> so for those who want to talk shit, it's like man, if they're real, that's why it's harder. Uh, yeah, I sign myself up for that, but right. it's what it is. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll continue the conversation. Yeah, yeah. It'd, it'd be fun. I just yeah. want to throw it in your ear and just you know yeah. Be, it might be a, a fresh new approach and, you know, yeah. do it the way that- I say animated, cool. animated stuff. You could do that really, fun. you could do really cool stuff with it. Yeah. Yeah. What does Soul Boom even mean? Well, the subtitle of the book is Why We Need a Spiritual Revolution. And I'm trying to just reinvigorate conversations around spirituality because spirituality either 
people have a knee jerk reaction against it because it means religion and it means church. And they're like, fuck that. I don't want to have anything to do with that. Right. Or, or it has to do with this really new agey, namby pamby, airy fairy kind of like crystals and yeah. incense and chakras. And, and it's this really like vague thing that. It's some more. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That, you know, their Aunt Connie was involved in and they're like, oh, I don't want to. But I do think that when you strip all that away, take out the church, take out the new age, spirituality means that I'm a spiritual being. I have 90 years in this fleshy, delightful fleshy body. And what does that mean? What kind of journey am I on? What's the meaning of life? What happens when I die? Do I have free will? What is love? What is beauty? Um, what is God? We talked a little bit about God. Like these big questions should be the questions that we're talking about all the time. And they're not church questions. Right. And they're not new agey questions. They're life questions. Right. It has as much relevance as, you know, positive psychology and the study of happiness and wellness. It's the study of of what our souls are. Like I don't believe that our consciousness comes to an end when we're 87 or 93 or 102, and then that's it, and that mm -hmm. there's no meaning to this gla vast, glorious, incredible uh, panoply of stars and matter and energy that it's just always been here. It does That doesn't make any sense to me. How do you grapple with how big it is? I mean, it's so big, we learn it's bigger every day bigger every day. It's and crazy. Yeah, how do you how do you wrap your mind around infinity because that's what the right. divine is. That's what it's yeah, I think we learn that there is no wall. I think if yeah. you you don't get to the end. It's not the Truman show. You don't bump into right, a exactly. wall that's what I was at the end. in my head, yeah. yeah. Do you mean do you think that there's uh, other intelligent life? I mean, I, I think at this point it'd be for me at least it, it would be incredibly insane if there wasn't. You'd have to be an idiot to think that there wasn't some other kind of life out there. I mean, that's crazy. Right. I mean, UAEs aside, like just like we're the only one out of trillions and trillions of stars, we're the only ones that that evolved here. Yeah. And also the other big mystery is like, how, why is there life on earth? Like there's there's chemicals, like when did chemistry turn into biology? When exactly and how do you have a bunch of chemicals? You've got magnesium and lithium and silicon and you know carbon and, oxygen and hydrogen and helium all kind of bouncing around to various degrees on planet earth when does a when does a paramecium or an amoeba you know or a when when does life start and how the the best answer someone has is like well it must have been on a meteorite that fell into the ocean which is just a total non-answer right but they're saying that it was caused by something right i yeah. mean it, 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 basically right caused by something, but it's one of the great, it's one of the great mysteries, you know, and, and no one, no one digs in. Also like the mystery of human consciousness, like yeah. we can be having this conversation and we can have memories about, you know, our families and we can feel things in our hearts and we can go compose poetry and operas and we can marvel at the beauty of a tree and, you know, we can come up with incredible mathematical formulas, like, Consciousness is beautiful and ineffable and magical. And and did that really just happen because we have slightly bigger brains than an ape? Is that really what consciousness is? I mean, I always wonder, and I'm sure Bill Nye, the science guy, or Neil deGrasse Tyson would debunk this somehow, but probably not definitively. If we evolved from apes, then why are they still around? <laughs> and and well, maybe there's some good reason for that, but... It, is but also like, what about the missing link? Like there's a, a bunch leap, there's right? a bunch of human species that they've found, mm -hmm. right? Right. And there's a bunch of monkey species, but like the whole thing of like the missing link. Where's the first one of us? <laughs> they, right. But they haven't really found like, where is that halfway between monkey? You can't say That's Neanderthal. Those no. are distinctly no, human. <laughs> they're distinctly human species. They're dead. Yeah. And there's chimpanzees and orangutans. Those are, are still around. Yeah. There's a distinctly, you know, monkey and ape species. And then- What's, what is in between and we don't have any fossils. It's a little bit weird. And that gets me into, what was it, Alien Resurrection? What was the one where the- The newest the, Alien movie? No, no, it was the one with the, the bald aliens came down and like made humans. Pr Prometheus? Yes, yes. that's the yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, that's a good yeah. one. 
you know, you wonder, like, yes, are we part of the, are we an anthill? Are we part of the experiment? I mean, think yeah. about even just on Earth, if there's some, you know, like, you go to South Georgia and there's some swamp preservation. We're like, hey, guys, don't go touch anything in this, you know, preserved area so the wildlife can be unbothered. Are we that in some way? Yeah. With a bunch w of these ships know? flying around. But here's the deal. Like, these aliens... Answer me this: the UAEs, mm -hmm. UAPs, um, UA, UA, okay. What's the UAE? United Arab Emirates? Yeah, is UAE IEDs or IUD is a that's a that's something else, right? Okay, that's a yeah, UAPs, unidentified aerial phenomenon, UAPs. Sorry about that. I like UFOs. That was always more. Well, fun. That's just that is more fun. But if these guys wanted to not be seen, certainly they have the technology to not be seen. Yeah. So they want to be seen and they want to show us that they have a technology that far surpasses anything we can even imagine, like instantaneously going from here to there and, you know, in vast numbers and, and disappearing. I know you have so many of those great stories. Mm -hmm. Like, so what are their, the alien species that are monitoring us? And I talk about this a little bit in my, in my book, Soul Boom. Mm. Um, I have a conversation among aliens that are observing planet earth. <laughs> right. uh, uh, about what they're seeing. Because what what are they seeing? They're seeing us destroy our own planet mm -hmm. with climate change. They're seeing us pump unlimited amounts of carbon and methane into the atmosphere, causing heat trapping gases to create a blanket and extreme weather events that are killing more and more people and ruining cro crops and starting droughts and and all kinds of stuff. They're seeing us do this. They're seeing us on the verge of war and actually fighting wars. Mm -hmm. Yep. And they're observing all that, but why do they want us to see them? Because they could just do it from behind the moon, right? What do you think? Well, they clearly don't want us to see them all the time. I mean, and maybe I wonder if we're just getting a glimpse of them where they were a moment ago. But they want us to have that glimpse because if they didn't want us to have they that glimpse- totally be yeah, they, could, they could control that, right? They but could they also, totally. They could also control landing on the White House lawn too. Sure. So like, you know, if- if there's ever like a disclosure moment and they reveal themselves to the whole world, they would clearly be in control of that. They would be holding that, it'd be up to them. I have the beginning of a science fiction movie and I want one of your fans to write it. Okay. okay. This alien spacecraft lands on the White House lawn, the hatch opens, an alien comes out. I don't know what it looks like. I don't know if it looks like an alien or it looks like a humanoid and says, has a translator device or something like that. So it's able to speak perfect English and says, I am the return of Jesus Christ. Oh boy. Cause Christ returning on a cloud, wow. right? Wow. What um, if Christ, what if the return of Christ was an alien? There's a lot of uh, stories in the Bible that sound a lot like uh, UFO sightings. Yes. Um, so if they're real, you, you wonder, yeah. What those big bright lights in the sky were. Yeah. Uh, where they, it was there Ezekiel and, and it was and gone. The, the chariot of the gods and the fire and oh, the yeah, whole thing. Oh yeah, they go back forever. Yeah. Um, that would be amazing. What's the craziest UAP, not UAE, story that, uh, from High Strange? What's the one that like, there's one that just sticks in your head and like, shit, this is so, so weird and real. I would real. say, uh, probably the biggest one to me it still has to be Travis Walton. And because I, I met with this person and, you know, I was able to give him a real assessment. This guy did not want to be there today. He begrudgingly met to tell me this story. He yeah. only even did it because I know someone who happens to know him, which is also weird. But he would have never talked about it because he's over it. Yeah. And he was clearly living through this traumatic experience. And so you have five different people saying that they all saw the same thing, right? They all saw him get sucked up into a spaceship in the middle of the woods in Snowflake, Arizona, and then he was missing for five days. And so either he was hiding and they were all in on it. Uh, where was he? I don't know, because they searched all the houses. Or he was unconscious in the woods and they couldn't find him on, on all the dog searches and he somehow didn't die out there or he was, or he's telling the truth. Um, it's just one of those things where it's, it's, it's almost weirder, yeah. the rational explanation for it. Um, and 
he's convinced after all these years that he was somehow injured by this craft and they actually saved his life is what he thinks. Mm. Like they're like, oh, shit. You know, like they're like, shit, we ran into his up, truck. Take yeah. him up. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I'm like, damn, it kind of makes sense. It's what like, does a spleen do again? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. They love poking around in all the different holes. Um, That's the thing about the alien abduction thing that, that gets me is like, really? Like, but what do you mean, really? Like, is it no, really the anal probe? Like, <laughs> we'll you know, do that here with the so probe. Or we, <laughs> all they need to do is like upload, uh, you know, all the biological information that they want. They don't need to like take someone up and like open their anus and go, boop, boop. But, may but maybe there's something just about that old school. <laughs> <laughs> But you cannot deny, you, know? you cannot deny the dozens or hundreds of military pilots around the world. The yeah. footage, all that stuff. The uh, firsthand of these sober, lifelong military guys. These are not some like crazy hippies living in the woods in Idaho. These are like they're they're like, you know, yeah, these are Air guys Force that, commanders. Yeah. Intelligent people that you trusted to operate the most advanced machines on Earth. Yeah. Those people are saying that a hundred percent. So it'd be more, and they have and they have footage. And they have footage. Yeah, um, yeah. I think that it's those stories are always credible to me, and I I often wonder. There's no way that all these stories that we've heard throughout generations, yeah. they're all not true. Yeah, like that would be more insane if we've got to a level of just intelligence as a human species where our imaginations have convinced us that. We've seen UFOs and aliens before, but doesn't, but and we does, know it's possible. But doesn't that sync up with NDEs, near-death experiences? A lot of stuff, yeah. Which is, does. which is a way that, you know, th you hear it all the time. Mm -hmm. Like people dying on the operating table, floating above the table, yeah. see the doctors working on them, are drawn into the light. There's some loved ones with them. Yeah. There's some kind of tunnel. There's some kind of vague understanding that they're, they're able to kind of witness their whole life more like on a tapestry rather than sequentially. Mm -hmm. So they're a little bit outside of time. Yeah. And they're kind of called there and they're called back and they choose to kind of come back. Like thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, every culture in the world. Like, did are we really having a collective like dream? Right. Like, That's what I'm saying. That would be more bizarre to me. You know what Occam's razor is, which is like the simplest answer is usually the right one mm. or the most correct I one? I mean, I know the phrase, yeah. This, the simplest answer is that near-death experiences are true, that that's what happens when we die. We're going into some kind of journey to life. That's a simpler answer than to say hundreds of thousands of people around the world are having the same weird illusory dream That's not about even their death. Right, yeah. I, I mean, I even feel that way sometimes about uh, like deja vu. Mm -hmm. Ever had a, like a really good one? Tons. Where you're just like, hey, Tons. this is not possible. When right? I, especially when I was younger, I had deja vu all the time. Where you're about to like, he's about to do this and you're gonna, yeah. what's up with that? Yeah. It, I mean, it could, it, it's convincing when you, if you have a good one. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I don't know. 100%. I, I, I think that, you know, if we're trying to get somewhere like, uh, as far as Pluto or something, we're not going to get there efficiently by some combustible engine. I think that yeah. somewhere in time and other realms or dimensions, whatever it is, we have to figure out how to. Key, we've got to figure out how to navigate time because mm -hmm. that's uh, and was, I love why I love the movie Interstellar so much. I actually watched I watched it last night again. What it, it holds up? Yeah. It's good. Oh man, rewatch. That's it's a good cool. rewatch. I've seen it like three times, but at the last time I, it's been at least five or six years. I love that movie. So but, good. But we have to figure out how to navigate time in some some really unique way. Otherwise, interstellar travel is just not possible. It's not possible. Yeah, we're not gonna be able to get there the way we we, we know. To, how. We have to go beyond the speed of light. I mean, forget the speed of light, we or just to. skip that step. Yep, yeah, skip that step. Maybe it's maybe far away is actually really close. Like that's what it is, right? So far away, but it's actually just right here on Maybe Earth. it's all an illusion. Maybe, exactly, right? Ever play around with AI? Like, ever ask it questions or anything? Vaguely, yeah, yeah not, not so much. I haven't gone there too much. Ever gotten anywhere fun? I, I like to have the AI uh, 
tell jokes in the style of a lot of my comedian friends, and then I send them those jokes. It's kind of funny that they can do that. <laughs> it, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, I, I put it to the test just to see the other day. I was like, I don't even know if it'll do this. I was like, write this like paragraph in the way that Payne Lindsay would say it in his new true crime podcast. Oh, nice. And it did it, and I was like, holy shit, that's pretty and good. And it was pretty it's good. pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and this is only the beginning of oh, scratching yeah. the surface of the AI, like oh, yeah. five years from now. Yeah, and the thing is, it's here to stay now. It's sure. there's no. It's like the internet. It's like wishing that the internet would go away. Yeah, like, or is that social media would go away. Yeah, well, it's here to too stay. late. Well, before I let you go, I want to show you one funny thing. Actually, it has to do with AI. So my friend... Uh, he's an engineer at Tenderfoot and he does a lot, all the sound design for Radio Rental and yeah. High Strange. He's really hip on all the new things. Um, so there's software now that can, you know, mimic your voice. Um, oh no. And so it, and it's just learning from all that's out there on the internet. So people like myself or Did you, it do Rain Wilson's who, voice? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll have him do it, but he did mine. I want to see if you can. Oh man. If you can. T <laughs> okay. This is, uh, I mean, it's a little robotic, but not by much. You're like, okay, maybe you could see how in like a year it would be out of control. Um, and there'll be some, I'll, I'll have to say, hey, that wasn't really me that said that really fucked up thing, <laughs> right? It'll be, yeah, that's which is like a deep fake of audio. It's yeah. Kind of scary, right? Okay, here we go. Greetings, fellow truth seekers, and welcome back to Up and Vanished, the podcast where we dive deep into the shadows of cold cases. I'm your host, Payne. But before we jump in, I want to share a message from our partner, Spot Pet Insurance. So I never said any of those words. I've never, I never, I didn't even give it anything. That's crazy. Greetings, fellow truth seekers. <laughs> Salutations, amis chercheurs de vérité. Et bienvenue à nouveau dans Up and Vanished, le podcast où nous plongeons au plus profond de l'ombre des affaires classées. All of a sudden, you're fluent in, fr in French. Yeah, I learned it real fast. Damn. Is what? It, what? Which one is that? I need to ask Cooper what it is. I'll, I'll text it to you. But he, I, he just blindly sent me like this in four languages, and I was like, "What the hell is going on?" And it hurt my brain. But I gave it nothing. I didn't. I never said these words. And it's That's, pretty close. Yeah. Yeah. Like especially if you don't know me, like you would just say, yeah, that's pain. Right? So I bet you yours is, pro is really that's good. That's scary. Too. That's absolutely scary. Yeah. So yeah. There'll, there'll be a moment where someone's getting well, I imagine over too, like, some audio they didn't But say. I imagine too, like, uh, uh, let's say that I was sued and I was totally bankrupt. <clears throat> and some company came and said, hey, for a million bucks, we want your likeness and your voice. We get to do whatever the hell we want to do with it. Mm -hmm. You sign it away. And I'm like, screw it. Fine. They own this, and they own this voice, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden, Rain Wilson is in like cat food commercials. Rain Wilson <laughs> is in porn. Rain Wilson <laughs> is in you know narrating all the things, things. That you wanted to do that you didn't get around to doing yeah. in, your, in your career. Cat food and porn, <laughs> but you know, I'm that could happen too. Right? Oh, totally. I mean, that's where that's what they want to do. I mean, it wasn't the writer's strike a little bit about there that? There was some. There were some aspects there of that. The tinge of that where like yeah. they can start. You know, I don't think that uh, I think the human touch is always going to be a, a step ahead of AI sure. in creativity. Yeah, you know, because it's always pulling from what we've already done. Yeah, but the recreating of of a voice. But you should do in a in one of your Payne Lindsay podcasts. You should, you know, you do all the you do the intro and you do a bunch of interstitial, interstitials. Make one of them AI and have people try and guess which one is the AI. Mm -hmm. uh, of AI Payne. That would yeah. be fun. We're just like, I squeeze in one segment of AI. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I bet you wouldn't be able to tell. Like an ad for better help or something like that. <laughs> That's what I really want it for. Yeah. So I can stop reading these damn ads. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I said it. I said it perfectly, actually. You want to you redo it? We got it. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks, man. It's been fun. Um, I appreciate catching up. Pain. Um, love what you do. Happy to be here with you. Great conversation. Well, I appreciate it, man. It's been a blast. Thanks, man. Yeah, cheers. Peace. Talking to Death is a production of Tenderfoot TV and iHeart Podcast, created and hosted by Payne Lindsay. For Tenderfoot TV, executive producers are Payne Lindsay and Donald Albright. 
Co-executive producer is Mike Rooney. For iHeart Podcasts, executive producers are Matt Frederick and Alex Williams, with original music by Makeup and Vanity Set. Additional production by Mike Rooney, Dylan Harrington, Sean Nerney, Dayton Cole, and Gustav Wilde for Cohito. Production support by Tracy Kaplan, Mara Davis, and Trevor Young. Mixing and mastering by Cooper Skinner and Dayton Cole. Our cover art was created by Rob Sheridan. Check out our website, talkingtodeathpodcast.com. Thanks for listening. And here's an exclusive sneak peek of the brand new season of Up and Vanished. Tune in to Up and Vanished every Friday, starting February 16th for the full episodes. I'm sleep deprived. My stomach's empty. And every breath I take feels like a conscious effort. I've been like this for days now disoriented and to put it bluntly scared out of my mind every sound every movement on this plane seems amplified my surroundings feel surreal like I'm watching myself in third person my mind just can't keep up with the pace of reality I've been on four different flights in the last 18 hours small rickety planes in the remote region of Northern Alaska. Thanks for listening to this episode of Talking to Death. This series is released weekly, absolutely free. But if you want ad-free listening and exclusive bonuses, you can subscribe to Tenderfoot Plus on Apple Podcasts or go to tenderfootplus.com.